say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another chance to be who you want to be. Yeah. My name is Jay Isso, and hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just telling you, today's show is so timely, so right on time. The book is called How to Launch Your Side Hustle. The author is Troy Underwood. Oh, is he good. Start and scale a business with minimal capital. I am telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this is the entrepreneurial book you should be buying. This should be in your possession immediately. This book is like literally the information is like trying to drink out of a fire hose. That's how much information is in this book. This thing is packed. This thing is just, I, I'm just telling you right now, look, I, I, I coach clients. I'm telling you, this book inspired me to change some things to do with my clients, things to do as a consultant and coach uh, and with my business folks. I'm just telling you, even in my own business, it, it opened my eyes to some things I'm not doing. Troy is with us. Troy Underwood. Yes, that Troy Underwood is with us. He is absolutely fantastic. You're going to love him. I promise you, you will. He's really so good. So, but let's do what we do every week, right? You know what we do every week, and that is we check in with you into the four areas of your life. You know, we're four-part people. We're physical people. We're mental people. We're emotional people and spiritual people. So let's check in on a scale of one to 10. And by the way, thank you, everybody from all over who's joining us live right now. Wow. Thank you. Hey, John Patuchka out in Mean, Nebraska. How about that? I'm, that's the last time I've done that shout. I can't remember when I've done that before, but it's great to see uh, John and so many people and cousin Lisa out there, everybody. So, but let's check in four areas of your life, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. The number one area in your life, right? Let's talk physically, right? You know, physically, you know, when I ask you on a scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding, what I'm really asking you is, how well are you taking care of yourself, right? I mean, are you are you doing the things that you need to do? Are you physically exercising? Are you eating right? Are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you doing the things that you need to do to be in the type of health you should be in, right? So how would you rank yourself on that scale of one to 10, right? Five is an average. We have two questions that we ask. The two questions are, okay, why are you that number, regardless of what that number is? And then the second question is, what can you do to change that number immediately, all right? So, you know, it, it, it could be a variety of things. Maybe it could be, you know what, as soon as the show is over, I'm going to go take a walk. Um, or, you know, and, and by the way, you can walk alone in your neighborhood. We can all do that, right? You can, you can do that. Time. Or maybe, you know what you could do? Maybe you could go out into your garage, you know, and just do some uh, burpees. Well, how about that? That would might be a bad idea, right? Do something. But do some exercise, right? Do some things for yourself, right? And stretch, yoga. There's all sorts of things that you can do uh, for yourself for sure. All right, so that's your first number. Second number is the mental number. And then, you know, here, I want to tell you something. What are you consuming, right? And you know what the problem is with most people right now in, in our day and age? You know what they're consuming? They're consuming garbage. And I mean that. You are consuming garbage. You are not consuming anything that is beneficial and positive to your brain. It is not growing you in absolute knowledge. It is not growing you in absolute wisdom. And it's not benefiting anyone, including yourself. Anything that is not benefiting you in terms of helping society is not mentally helping your game. All right? Anything that you do mentally should be something that you are able to give back to other people. And, you know, anytime that something makes you angry or upset, it's not a good thing to watch. Sorry. It's just not. Anything that puts you into a negative mode is, is just a bad part. We'll talk about that more on the emotional side. So what are you consuming? What can you consume that actually is going to grow your knowledge, actually is going to grow your wisdom, and is actually going to make you more positive and actually contribute more to society in a positive way? That's what you're looking at here. How well are you doing that, right? I hear people say, I hate to read. You know what? Get over it. Start reading. Seriously, you just got to. And if you can't do that, then read, then listen to audiobooks. All right. Because those are readily available. All right. And there are so many positive things out there that can actually get you to grow in wisdom. I'm telling you, this book that Troy has written here, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, basically on, you know, start a new business with minimal capital. You know, I'm telling you right now, right? This is a book that's going to enhance you. It's going to make you better. That's that's something you could do right away. So what's your number? And then why are you that number? And then what can you do to change it? 
All right, so you got two numbers, physical number, mental number. Then next comes the, the emotional number, right? And Troy and I may get to <laughs> the importance of emotional intelligence uh, because emotional intelligence is really, really extremely important, especially when it comes to hiring employees. But it's important for us, right, as leaders and as, as, as our own people. And what we mean so many times by emotional intelligence is how well are you able to control your emotions, A, and then B, how well are you able to understand the emotions of others? And not just understand them, but empathize with them, right? How well are you able to do that? That's really part of emotional intelligence. And the question becomes, what are, are how are you doing that? Are you doing it well, right? Are you able to control those emotions? I mean, like right now with everything that's going on, how well are you able to control your emotions? Do you know that you can? You can make a choice to control your emotions. Circumstances do not have to dictate how how you feel you can feel the way you want to feel today right now you can choose it all right and and the more more times you make that choice to say i'm not going to fear i'm not going to be afraid i'm not going to feel angry i'm not going to feel sad i'm not going to feel i'm going to i'm going to focus on you know what i've got a lot to be grateful for i got a lot to be happy for i've got a lot to be thankful for i've got so much i got great friends i got great people and and you know what people here's the thing this is an intentional thing that you can do every day, every moment of every day. And so you, you need to start feeding yourself, first of all, good things. You need to write down your gratitude list so that you're emotionally in a better place. You need to choose the right emotions and you need to stay there and be positive. That's the beautiful part about the emotional tension. So what do you need to change? You know, how are you doing and what do you need to change? Because I've got to encourage you, I got to tell you folks, man, Challenge is awesome, and we have an awesome opportunity to help so many people uh, if we get it emotionally right. And then finally, so you've got three numbers, right? So finally, we've got the final number, and that's the spiritual number. And people ask me spiritually, what does that really mean? And what that means is if you remove the physical, the mental, and the emotional, what do you have left? And the fact is there's a lot left that we can't explain, that we can't see, that we don't understand necessarily very well. Uh, but we know that there's something inside of us that uh, it, science doesn't really understand, nor does it, is it able to explain on any level, but there's something inside of us that brings us a sense of centeredness, a sense of peace, a sense of joy. There's something inside of us that yearns for something else that's beyond emotions, that's not something that we can think through, it's not something that we can physically touch, but that we know spiritually affects us. And it is that thing that I'm asking you about right now is how are you doing in that area? And it comes in a variety of ways. It can come in like a belief in God. It can come in, a, in, in some people believe in nature and some people believe in meditation, daily meditation, or even regular meditation. Some people believe in a variety of other things that they believe gets them centered and gets them back. My question is, how's that working for you? And if it's not working, then what do you need to do to change it? Right? So you have these four areas of your life. These four areas of your life are like, you know, the four legs of a chair. And, you know, if a chair uh, has uneven legs and you sit in it, and you know what the problem is? The problem is when you sit in it, your, your posture is going to be off. The same token, if the chair is too low, what happens is it's really hard to get in and out of a chair that's too low. And so our goal is to bring up all four of these numbers in an equal way so that we're sitting in the chair that we're supposed to sit in at the right height. And speaking of somebody who sits in a chair at the right height, his name is Troy R. Underwood. He is a graduate of UC Davis. He has a talent for finding technological solutions for business problems. Uh, he, is the, he, he was the founder, he actually founded, how about this? He founded FDI, which is a computer consulting uh, company that was in Sacramento, California. And he developed a patented web-based solution for electronic motor vehicle title administration. Uh, with great success, uh, Troy sold FDI uh, about, uh, well, I guess it was pretty close to 29, 29 years, 19 years later, 29 years later, 19 years later. And then prior to that sale, he was also, he had founded another company called Transcend Technology Groups, which was a professional software development and computer network and consulting firm. And then he was in pro, approached by a local insurance broker in the early 2000s um, community, and he needed to find an a online benefit broker solution. And so um, guess what he did? He figured it out. So now he's the CEO of Benefits Connect one of the nation's leading on-roll enrollment and eligibility tracking systems for health insurance brokers. 
Uh, he strategizes, strategizes ways to provide sophisticated cutting edge technologies that improve efficiency and benefits communication within the broker community. He served as the National uh, Association of Health Underwriters, um, version eight, region eight in technology chair and is a frequent industry speaker and noted author. And he has served two years as the member chair of Sacramento Association of Health Underwriters. He now uh, is does so much in health and he's a great health writer and um, he is absolutely awesome and one of the best entrepreneurs that you will ever listen to. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Troy Underwood. Troy Underwood, welcome to A New Direction. Jay, it's great to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. So hey, listen, I love this book and I was, I was dead serious when I said, you know what, this book, is, this book on entrepreneurship is literally like you know, drinking, drinking water from a fire hose. I mean, man, there is just one list after another <laughs> that you packed into 125 pages of actual text. And this thing is powerful and I love it. So let's, without further ado, let's just kind of just start going, digging into this and let's, let's just start in chapter one and here's, and, cha and I love the chapter. So let's just talk for titles. So let's talk about it. Most entrepreneurs are not entrepreneurs is the name of the chapter title. Um, you, you start off by saying John Baptiste say, John Baptiste say says the entrepreneur shift econ, who, who actually came up with it uh, the, the term entrepreneur the entrepreneur shifts economic resources out of an area of lower and into an area of higher productivity and greater yield. And you go on to say that in today, an entrepreneur is one who undertakes an enterprise, especially a contractor ask, acting as the intermediary between capital and labor. So let's talk about, in terms of setting that scale, that, that up, let's talk about most entrepreneurs or non entrepreneurs and what some of the key traits are and, and what we need to, what our mindset needs to be. Well, yes, an entrepreneur, a lot of people describe an entrepreneur as just a business owner. Uh, they, they went down to the Corner 7-Eleven bought a franchise, uh, any type of franchise, and they think they're an entrepreneur. <laughs> and I'm not going to argue with them to say that they are or aren't. It's like, don't use that word. Um, but if you define it as you did or, or talk about it as the intermediary between labor and capital, well, doesn't that leave out a lot of people who are actually mm -hmm. moving things to a higher value chain? They're actually doing entrepreneurial things as defined by say. And they're using their own capital. Right. They're using their own labor. So what about the people that don't go down to Sand Hill, you know, go to Silicon Valley, go to venture capital, get $50 million in financing, and then go hire a whole bunch of people and be that entrepreneur that is the intermediary between labor and capital? What if your labor comes from your left hand and your capital comes from your right hand and whatever you can find in the couch seat cushions? Mm -hmm. uh, is that person not an entrepreneur? Well, if they went out and just did something that a thousand other people are doing every day, they, they didn't increase productivity at all, they didn't change a business model, they didn't improve anything, they're just running their restaurant franchise. They didn't come up with new recipes, distribution, it's all the same. I'm gonna say they're not an entrepreneur. They might be wonderful, and there's nothing to disrespect anything they're doing there. They're a business owner and that's great. So it's not necessarily a function of the risk in, in just a financial sense, did you take a risk? Um, but what other risk did you take? And, and in the book, I talk even further about necessity entrepreneur. So you can have a risk taker, let's say Howard Hughes. I mean, come on, the guy was a risk taker. With, with money, he was a risk taker. With flying, he was a risk taker. But he was a risk taker where he always had daddy's money to fall back on. So how much risk can you take when you can't fail? So if you're, if you're running, I mean, one of the things that uh, I've learned in, in watching real estate transactions, if you borrow a little bit of money, you have a creditor debtor relationship. If you borrow a lot of money, I mean, an awful lot of money, those banks will never let you go down. You can't go under, you have a partnership there. So look at the risk involved in what it takes to actually be an entrepreneur versus a business owner. So, uh, by the way, we're talking with Troy Underwood, author of the book, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, um, Start and Scale a Business with Minimal Capital. Uh, fabulous book, available at Amazon, bookstores, everywhere, uh, wherever books are sold, just pick up your copy. It's absolutely fabulous. So let's talk, you, you kind of alluded to it. Let's talk about the makeup of a necessity, necess uh -huh, boy, how about that? My tongue just got tied. Uh, the makeup of a necessity entrepreneur. I got a feeling that could be a tongue twister. 
uh, let's talk about it because you were a necessity entrepreneur and and I don't think everybody understands what a necessity entrepreneur is. So why don't we talk why don't you talk about that and who that is and what that looks like and 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 how it how it actually happened for you? Sure. You know, and I looked at it basically after the fact. I, I didn't approach this. Uh, whether it's elementary school or college or starting my first business and say, I'm going to be a necessity entrepreneur. I looked at it after the fact and said, what I did, I did out of necessity. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. And like I described, a, a certain type of entrepreneur will go out there, get a whole bunch of financing, hire a whole bunch of people and, and run their business model. And those are fantastic. I, I was in Silicon Valley. There was just every other corner had a new startup of somebody who just got 50 or $100 million and is now running a new business. And you know, back in the, the late 80s and 90s, everyone was talking about their burn rate. Well, a necessity entrepreneur will never brag about their burn rate. A necessity <laughs> entrepreneur will keep that down to as close to nothing as possible, understanding that sometimes if, if you go into the negative, so you got to look at how am I going to finance that? And this is, this even the book is really for the other 99% that start small businesses that have an entrepreneurial endeavor behind them. Then the necessity entrepreneur, first of all, I take it a step further, you know, like you described your, your four um, personal traits there uh, to start out with, which are fabulous, wonderful, by the way. Uh, I look at it more than just the business. I look at the entrepreneur as a human being in, in all aspects. So as, a, as an economics major, I really like the idea of utility. So you're not looking at it just to say, how much money did I make? You're looking at your overall well-being in all aspects, whether it's a uh, spiritual, physical, emotional, um, financial, and how well are you doing in all aspects? You don't want to be the wealthiest man in the cemetery. <laughs> There's no honor in that. No, there isn't. Uh, you don't. You, you want to take care of your family. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go start a family and that's, that's part of life, take care of your health, take care of your family. So I do stretch out beyond just a, the monetary side of it because I think the monetary side of it, one is overrated. And if you have children, as I did, I, I would not only attend at all my kids' sporting events, PTA meetings and school plays and, and what have you, but uh, I also coached their team. So that was just part of my uh, idea of what I want to get out of life. So while you're doing that, sometimes you need to make sacrifices. And those sacrifices um, can be deliberate, but you make sure that uh, you keep food on the table. I, I, in the book, I talked about uh, Goodyear. Mm -hmm. and, and Goodyear, he vulcanized rubber. I mean, this is fantastic stuff, except he forgot about the fact that he had kids that needed to be fed and a wife that needed to be fed, and most of his kids died from starvation. Right. He went to debtor's prison and he was so obsessed with this vulcanized rubber that he forgot about his other obligations. So no amount of success in business can compensate for failure in the home. So make sure you stay focused and, and well-rounded. So that I know that sounds the opposite, focused, focused on what you need to do, focused on what's important, but well-rounded to take care of your family, your own health, um, keep getting educated, run the uh, intellectual side of it as, as every other point you made out, physical. And sometimes that's very emotional. So you can um, do what needs to be done in the necessity world and, and putting food on the table is a necessity. Uh, we're talking with uh, author, outstanding author, Troy Underwood. And one of the things, the book is entitled uh, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, Start and Scale Your Business uh, with Minimal Capital, uh, which he has done over and over and over again. Uh, one of the things that you say in in the in the book about this is that entrepreneurship, and you just said it, entrepreneurship is is about more than business principles. It's a way of thinking about and reacting to the world. Business principles and best practices are great, but the person working behind those principles is just as important. And I, I found that to be a really powerful message, Troy. Um, that you know, I think so often people will get into this idea of wanting to build their own business because either they a they think they're going to make a whole bunch of money um, or b that they've got this idea that they are like Charles Goodyear so obsessed with that they can't let it go and they sacrifice everything along the way including all the relationships but i think you know i think the thing is about you know necessity entrepreneurs 
And you said this best, that you're in business to put food on the table for your family and take care of them. And I, I just found that to be refreshing. Um, and I hope everybody else is too, because they, I mean, it's just a very refreshing way of thinking about it. I agree hundred uh, percent. Absolutely. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I'm, and, and that, and, uh, I, I wasn't sure you were going to add that. I, I am going to add a couple of things though, if you don't mind, um, here real quick, when I'm just going to add some of the stuff from the list, it's called the ingredients for necessity entrepreneurship. That's in the book. You say it's family oriented, self-funded, self-directed, self-delivered, growth oriented, um, disruptive and technologically savvy. Um, I thought th that's a really good list, really a good list. I really, I really love your list there. If you were to pick one of those that you said, okay, do, do you feel like there's one, I mean, I know you talked about the family oriented part of it as being the kind of a number one, but is there one outside of family oriented that you go, yeah, you need to re this is really critical or do you feel like they're all are? Well, they all are, but if I just focus on one, maybe growth oriented, and back to the differentiation between a, a business owner and a necessity entrepreneur is if you're looking to grow something, what's your exit? Mm -hmm. Do you want to, do you want to just run a business and you know, it does its job. And then in at the end, whenever that is 10, 30 years down the road, you just take down the shingle and put closed up. Mm -hmm. That's fine but that's not a necessity entrepreneur. Um, even after years or decades of success, do you wanna hand it off to your kids or your grandkids? Do you wanna run an employee program where they take over the company? Do you wanna sell it? So think about the exit. And if you're planning to grow your company, then you're saying, I'm always pushing, I'm always moving forward. Uh, growth in, in financial terms is what I'm mostly speaking of, because that seems to follow with uh, you know, employees and growth and clients and growth, you know, growth in the revenue is what I'm really focusing on there. So think about that. That tells you too in your business, if you get into it, do a, do a real good analysis, you know, look in the mirror and ask yourself some serious questions. Is this scalable? Can I grow it? And does it have economies of scale? Is it one for one for everything I grow? Or can I get a, a multiple right. outside of that? Getting real economies growing. That's awesome. His name is Troy Underwood, and he's joining us here on A New Direction. Hey, New Direction has, you know, sponsors, right? Because that's how we do the show. We are so grateful for our sponsors. Uh, Epic PT is the most recent sponsor. Sponsor. They've been with us. And by the way, they have new ownership, and, and they are still the same great company that they always were. They're the same great physical therapists that they always were. They still are certified. They still are fantastic. And whether you're recovering from an injury or a surgery or suffering everyday aches and pains or having difficulty performing the activities of daily life, or maybe you're, on, you're, you're an elite athlete and you cannot perform your athletic event uh, at the right level. And listen, some of us are, you know, well, most of us are down. We're not doing any athletes, so now's a great time to heal. But why not heal right with the certified experts at um, Epic Physical Therapy? Listen. They will provide you with a customized treatment plan tailored to your individual needs. And with their experience in rehabbing young athletes to elite professionals, they really do understand the need to treat the entire body as a functional whole, not just your symptoms or your inner injury. So if you're looking for epic relief, if you're looking for epic recovery and you want epic results, you need to look no further than epic physical therapy. And you can learn more by going to www.epicpt.com. That's Epic PT, E P I C P T dot com. And of course, Linda Craft and Team Realtors. No matter where you're at in the world, you know what? Linda Craft and her team can help you find the right realtor to sell your home or buy your home. They are independently owned and operated and unaffiliated. They are privately, they're just a private small business that has established and made relationships around the world for over 30 years five years, which allows them to find the absolute best professional when it comes to real estate. So when you're ready to sell your home or buy your home, whether regardless of where you live, why not start with the relationship people? They are literally have been known for 35 years as having legendary customer service. I didn't say that. They didn't say that. That's what their customer says about them. So you know what? Why not check them out? Why not go to lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. 
And we're back here with Troy Underwood in his book, How to Launch Your Side Hustle. And uh, fantastic book, Start and Scale a Business with Minimal Capital. You know, what a great thing that we could be doing right now is to start a business with a uh, little capital as possible. And that's kind of what entrepreneur, that, well, it is what entrepreneur, real entrepreneurship is really about, as Troy has alluded to. Troy, I want to I jump ahead a little bit here um, into chapter two, and because chapter two is about choosing and funding. And <laughs> you make a great statement. And I'm one of these people, right, as a guy who starts his own thing. You say the real problem for most entrepreneurs is not coming up with an idea, but rather picking one idea out of the dozens of exciting visions bouncing around in their minds on any given day. <laughs> and that's so true. So how do we choose the right idea to go into if we want to be an entrepreneur? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, I guess somebody could flip a coin, but typically you have to see, think about them. Go for a walk, go for a run on the beach. And, and after a while, you might come back and see, you know, the one of my 10 ideas, the one that keeps coming back to me as being the best, and, and you'll feel it. Um, and then there's a caution too on if you just go off of feelings and you're too emotionally attached to it, that, that could be a bad thing too. So sometimes you get these ideas write them down. You don't have to write a formal business plan, but write down some of your ideas, read them a few days later, let other people uh, in on it. Let them talk to you. You can't be just friends and family. They're going to tell you, Troy, what a wonderful idea. <laughs> uh, they're going to hopefully give you some accurate direction. And if it's a horrible idea, they should tell you. If you get too um, passionate about it, you think, oh, I'm going to do this just because it's going to be my passion, but it has no way to either be scalable or even make any money or barely hope to break even, then it's probably not a good idea to run that. And, uh, you know, you, you can get maybe a, a good accountant or something, pay somebody a few hours consulting fees to look at. You can probably get somebody for free if you go to, you know, SCORE or somebody else that will, will give entrepreneurs um, some business direction. They've been there and they look at it. Pretend you're a venture capital firm or an investor, whether it's friends, fools, and family, or another step up, an angel investor or a venture capital. How would they look at your business plan? Can they make money on it? Now, their only goal, really, for the most part, is to make money. And if they can't make money on it, they're not going to jump into it, no matter how passionate you are about it. So look at the one that you also have some skill and actual ability to execute. Mm. And then once you come up with it and you start going on it, don't just stop at when you hit your first hurdle and go to the next idea. Have some patience. Have some perseverance. Yeah, I, I, you talk about here and, and you talk about having a clearly defined idea and that you, you need to kind of ask yourself some questions like identifying the short and long-term market potential. You know, like you say things like, who is the customer for this product or service? How many customers are there out there? And and you go on to list several of these things. I think I think this is the you know I think it you know this is where the left brain and the right brain kind of have to work together here, right? I mean, you you kind of have and you make this point I think so saliently, is that you know it's not just okay I can't I'm obsessed about it, but also I know what the potential is for it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that I think that people think when they get into this entrepreneur world, and it just is, a, it, is that they think it's the easy, the, they, they just are going to try to find the easiest path. That's not it, is it? It's really not. It's, it's, it's a lot of work and it has great rewards potentially. But if you look at the success failure rates, mm -hmm. chances are, so you, tell, you tell somebody, that you're going to be an entrepreneur, they say, oh, great, you have a 90, high 90s percent chance of failing. <laughs> Whereas, you know, you, you tell them you just got hired with your master's degree at, um, you know, Apple Computers or something, they say, great, you have a, you know, high 90s chance of, of having a job there in right. five or 10 years. Right, right. So the numbers don't really speak well to a lot of entrepreneurs. And, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, and, and, and it never is. And, you know, listen, I get it. 
I mean, I, I think I've probably, I think when you talk to anybody who's an entrepreneur, they'll tell you that they probably failed more than they succeeded. You know, I mean, honestly, if they're being really honest because they've had so many ideas that they've let go or that didn't work out. You, you talk about one of the things about the ideas that you create, you say for an idea to have merit, you should be able to identify a clear target audience. And you say, be wary of marketing to everyone and competition should not be exceptionally fierce. Can you explain that a little bit further? Well, in, in terms of marketing to everyone, you have to narrow that down. You're probably, if you enter this and you're, as I've described, a necessity entrepreneur running on minimal capital, yada, yada, you're not going to be doing television ads. Mm -hmm. uh, just the opposite. You're, you're going to be very narrow, very focused, you, especially when you're starting up. And, and you have to know who your, your suspects and turn them into prospects and the marketing uh, flow there. So take a narrow approach, figure out what your niche is, what you're going to do. You know, e even Amazon didn't start out with everything. They started out narrow and then they expanded on that. So start out narrow, do what you do, do it well, execute that before you keep just adding more stuff. And, and see if you can monetize what you started out with. If you can't monetize what you started out with, it may not be a good idea, if your core is not working well, to keep adding new features or benefits or products or services. Uh, we're talking with uh, Troy Underwood, author of How to Launch Your Side Hustle, Start and Scale a Business with Minimal Capital. Fabulous book. Buy it. Bookstores everywhere. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, really, th seriously, this book is... Uh, this this one stays in the library forever. This one is just absolutely a go-to. Uh, the book literally is drinking the information from a fire hose. It's literally one list of practical, applicable information that you're going to love. It's it's simply a fantastic book. You you also say shortly after this in in this point in the book, you said something that I found really really intriguing because I think this is a temptation of most of us who are in the entrepreneurial world world. And that is, don't you say, don't go head to head with a well-established competitor. Enhance the value chain, carve your own niche, and find a way to start small and steadily scale as you grow. Talk to us about that, because I think so often we want to go, okay, I got this great idea. I can take on the Amazons of the world. But you you have this that gives you give us a little bit different take. So talk us talk us down from the ledge of taking on the big guys. Well, one, you probably don't have the resources to go after the big guys. And sometimes when you're going after the big guys, it, it's not just that they can outmarket you, they can outsell you, they can out do, they may not be able to outproduce you. I mean, in the sense that you may have better ideas. And you'll watch a lot of these large companies. I mean, how how creative is Microsoft? Look at their whole history. Uh, Microsoft bought a whole lot of what they have. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's fine. Matter of fact, you might, if you're in, in high tech, I mean, I'm focusing mostly on high tech, but this applies to a lot of other areas. It, you know, you could be making furniture is the first thing you're going to do, go up against Ethan Allen, and maybe you <laughs> want your niche. But as long as you come up with, with your niche, and unless you're so huge, don't try to be everything to everyone. Sometimes the hardest word to say is no. Mm. So if you have, you know, maybe you have a prospect and they say, well, can you also do this? And then you have to look at it and go, well, that's really going to take me too far off of my path right. and say no, especially if you're going to try to scale what you're doing. They, they, the customer base has to fit uh, your operation. So in terms of software, it's not that hard to add features. You just have to know when to stop and monetize what you've got and focus on your core and then go how to sell it. Sell it. So when I started with the uh, electronic motor vehicle titles, uh, at one point I did have a competitor. I'm very, at the time, if you if anyone puts their way back hat on and remembers uh, GMAC, it's no longer GMAC now, but General Motors, and on the board of General Motors was Ross Perot, and he had a company called EDS. Yep. And I wanted to take a different approach initially than EDS because I didn't want to go up against a, a very large competitor. So I took a different path and uh, that was going after smaller initially. Now I didn't want to do it forever, but at least initially and initially could be, Hey, I'm going to take out two or three quarters to do it. It gives you a chance to perfect your pitch. If you will perfect your product, perfect your, your service offering right. and without 
trying to have your first uh, sales pitch be to the largest bank in the nation or the largest prospect or, or potential customer in the nation. Go after some that are a little bit more forgiving and uh, work off of your alpha sites, your beta sites, and then put it into production. And if you don't do something initially that shows all the competition, how fantastic this could be. So I went out and deliberately, and this sounds kind of odd, deliberately didn't price it too high. I know that people are going, oh, I want to be able to charge as much money as I can. Because I knew that the barriers to entry were, were pretty minimal. I mean, you could hire a few software developers, sit down if they have some brilliant ideas and maybe some banking and, uh, and DMV experience, they could write this. This is not anything that, you know, yeah, I patented it and I had some interesting ideas, uh, but I didn't patent the whole thing and I didn't patent the relationship between a motor vehicle administrator agency and a, uh, and, and a customer or a bank or financial institution. So anybody could go out and do it. But if they looked at it and they're gonna run an analysis and say, what's this opportunity? And they're gonna go, well, this company over here called FDI, they're, they're charging a few hundred dollars per customer per month. That is not gonna get anybody interested in changing their business model to go compete with you. But at the same time, I'm thinking about that going, that's enough for me to keep food on the table while I grow this and grow this. And in a few years, I will have enough. You do enough of that. And you're getting three, four, five, six, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars per customer per month. And it's a hundred percent recurring revenue. At some point that does begin to run into some real numbers. And that's what it did. I mean, I was scaling it from the beginning, but if you're looking at it, somebody wanted to look at my business the first, you know, the first year, it's like you're making peanuts, Troy. Right. Well, you have to have a bigger picture. I have a bigger long-term plan. So don't be afraid to think, but you can't think too long term either. Right, At some right. point, you gotta you gotta monetize it and and see what you can do with it. Uh, his, his name's Troy Underwood. The book is called How to Launch Your Side Hustle. Uh, basically, start and scale in business with minimal capital. Um, he, Troy, uh, you say entrepreneurs make two two of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make. One is overspending on costs that are not necessarily crucial, and then the second the second is underestimate or out outright overlook major expenses. Talk about those two mistakes. Well, the expense, the expense side is, is huge. So a lot of people might get into a small business and whether it's overspending on space, you know, physical space, office space, it's, it, you know, it's really, especially in Silicon Valley, it's so famous to hear all these people that started out of their garage. You know, or maybe you took a, a room in your house that's probably smarter, depending on what stage you're in and, and what kind, especially now, you know, you don't really have to have a, an office to impress right. everybody. There's some, especially, you know, in the next month or two, everybody will be working remotely anyway. Right. So that's in the early days. I mean, my daughter, Ashley, when she was really, really young, I, uh, I worked in her nursery. So I had the computer in half of the nursery and then she was in the other half. And usually I could time her naps really well. Once in a while, I'd be talking to a prospect or a client and they would say, is that a baby I hear? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> you know, so you, you know, could have gone out and hired a babysitter. Right. I could have gone out and bought, uh, you know, at least an office space. But if you look at that and go, okay, what's the, what's the value of that? Do I have the money to do that? So don't overspend if it's, whether it's labor or uh, office space or products. I mean, but spend on your core, what you really need. Right. I always had a pretty high end computer. Right. That's what I did. Right. Um, so look at the evaluate it. If it's something that, you know, there's a few things too, you might want to spend a little bit more on to make you look bigger than you are. Right. So back in the day, now I wouldn't do this today, but back in the day, we did a lot of print um, mailers, marketing pieces. You wanted those to look good. Right. If you come across looking cheap, uh, you're just you're going to lose them right off. Right. And so don't don't overspend on anything that uh, you can avoid. Underestimating, you, you're it's notorious for saying it's always going to take longer and cost more. Right. 
So leave a little bit of a cushion in there, whether it's a construction project um, for your house or office or whether it's a software development, you know, they, they always say, hey, when you are 90% of the way done, then you have 90% of the work left to do. And, you know, that, that always holds true for software projects. So don't, don't, uh, don't think it's going to take less time than you think it's going to take. Hmm. Uh, Troy Underwood's joining us right now. Uh, to, uh, how to launch your side hustle. Uh, Troy, so one of the things that you say, this is the other side of it, you, you say commit to following through. To be a good entrepreneur, you have to have the grit and resilience to see an idea through to the end. Talk about yes, that a little bit. That's the, that's the, that's the patience and the perseverance. Uh, and follow through on everything, more than just your business and your idea. Um, you know, I mean, when I was a, a software developer, and it, there's a lot of tough times. I remember a friend of mine, uh, I was talking to him one time, and I was like, Mark, this is just, this is just horrible. I think I'm going to go back and just get a real job like real people do. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. And I'm glad he did. Um, but, you know, somebody has to, has to you know, cheer you up right. on your down days. Right. But, uh, you know, if you still see it and know that the vision is there and it has merit, right. um, keep, keep at it. You know, the other thing I to say on that is follow through with your customers. When you say you're going to do something, mm. do it. Right. And if you can't, I used to tell uh, new employees all the time at FDI, the number, the second most important rule at FDI is never leave a client in the dark. Mm. Never leave a client in the dark. If you made a mistake, tell them. And by the way, use these words. I made a mistake. Mm. Don't try to brush it under the rug. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Say these words. I made a mistake. They'll respect that. Nobody expects you to be perfect. And say, I'll have it fixed by, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday. And then make sure you fix it by Tuesday or Wednesday. And if you can't, then you call them on Monday. Don't wait until after the fact and don't let them call you. You call them and you tell them, I know I said I'd have it fixed on Tuesday. It's really going to take another day. At least never leave a client in the dark. Oh, and by the way, the number one most important rule was you must never cross the streams. <laughs> okay, what do you mean by that? Well, which, by the way, dates everybody. Oh, yeah, we have never yeah, 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 if you've, if, by the way, for all those who are youngins that are listening to the show and you've never seen the original Ghostbusters, yeah, okay, we, that's how far back we go. Go ahead. <laughs> that, was, that was it, exactly. You got it. <laughs> but what do you mean by don't cross the streams? I mean, it was, it was just a joke, actually. Oh. I, always I didn't get it. It's, I always, it's, always, by the way, tell my, my yeah, employees, so by, so by the way, I would wait. I would <laughs> For someone to say, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what's so funny? Here's here's the thing. So for those of you who will be listening, I know I've got a bunch of people listening live, and and people on Oak ninety three point five FM, uh, you're listening, and this is this has been recorded on April first, which is April Fool's Day, and here uh, Troy is, who I am so into his book, I'm waiting for, I'm not waiting for him to be to come up with something funny, don't cross the streams. I'm thinking, well, he just used, <laughs> just used a <laughs> reference from a great movie and he totally got me totally. Okay. I admit that he got me. Uh, and you're, he's joining us here on a new direction. The book's called how to launch uh, your side hustle. Hey everybody. You know what? Epic physical therapy uh, is our sponsor. One of our sponsors and their facility offers the most advanced top of the line equipment, including the alter G anti-gravity treadmill, the Norma tech compression sleeves, Game Ready, which I love. Man, I love that ice compression thing all at the same time. It's absolutely fantastic. They are, their, their people are trained and certified in the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments available. Some of them include blood flow restriction therapy, uh, which is very cool. Dry needling, which I get done periodically, which is just fantastic for swelling. And then cupping, which just allows the muscles to relax. And these are just a few of the things that they do. Look, you can learn how you can make your 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 body more epic and you can get that epic relief that epic recovery and those epic results if you just go to epic pt just go to epicpt.com it's e p i c p t.com that's e p i c p t.com and Linda Craft and Team Realtors for 35 years they have been at the top of the market in the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina and they have been serving the world 
Yes, literally serving the world. And how do they do that? It's because they can recommend the best realtors everywhere in the world. So if you're looking to sell your home or buy your home and, uh, you know, or looking to invest, why not start with the folks who are known as the legends of customer service when it comes to real estate? Literally, that's what their customers and clients say about them. They are just a, have legendary customer service. And, you know, something I'm going to tell you something else about them. You know, they give back to their community in such a variety of different ways, whether it's the Red Cross um, or other local community events. They are literally the community real estate champions. They really are. And you know what? That's been Linda's. That's been Linda's life. That's been that's been her, and that's going to be her legacy, is giving back to as many as she can. And so, that's her team. So why not check them out at LindaCraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we are back here uh, on a new direction uh, with Troy Underwood, who just got me, just totally got me. Uh, on, he was making a joke and I'm trying to take him seriously. Go, what does that mean? Uh, how to launch <laughs> your side hustle. And, uh, hopefully are you smiling, Troy? Please tell me you're smiling. At yes. some point. Okay, great. Yes, I am. Uh, start and scale a business with minimal capital. Uh, by the way, th this book is fantastic. Uh, and clearly, you know, as we're in the last segment of the show, we are not going to be able to get through the whole book, which is never the intention of the show. The intention for you is, uh, for Troy to give you a flavor and a taste of the book. Uh, so that you go out and purchased it. I, I'm just telling you, this book is literally 125 pages of one list after another of practical, applicable things that you can do to really be the best entrepreneur that you can possibly be. And I have found these so valuable that even as a coach and consultant, that uh, I, I can tell you that I am going to apply so many of these principles uh, that I wasn't even, you know, I, I, maybe I practice some of them, but there's more that I really can take into me and arm me with some really great information. So really check out how to launch your side hustle. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. Troy, let's move on to funding the idea. And, <laughs> uh, because, you know, everybody says, I got a great idea. I just don't got any money. Oh, Troy, do you hear them whining? Can you hear them whining to you? I, Cause I can oh, hear them yeah. whining. Right? They, I hear them whining, going, Troy, I have this great idea, but I don't have any money. How do I get money for my idea? Okay, so talk, talk, talk them off the ledge. Well, first of all, if you are the labor, as I was, so I was just uh, sat down in front of a computer, although you're going, well, how did you get money to buy your computer? <laughs> um, and, and the amount of money differs by people. Sometimes you say you need a small amount of money. To some people, that means you know, $10 million, small amount. Uh, for some people, it means 10,000. For some people, people, it means 100. I need a small amount of money. I only need 100 bucks. I've seen some people put up business plans, and they only want like $900 to start it. Right. Uh, so the, the number differs based on you know, the, the people, their goals, the, and the requirements to start it. They have high capital expenditures. You know, are you going to buy something that has the, a real estate component to it that you can't finance or, or big machinery or something like that? But if you're in a service industry, let's say you just want to start a consulting business because you have a particular expertise and you want to go out and charge people your hourly rate or however you set it up to go do that. Well, the funding on that is very easy, but you need to have enough to get, you know, in today's world, probably a, an iPhone or something like that and a portable computer and an iPad or something. Let's say it's only a few thousand dollars, but let's say you don't have it. Um, there's some simple ways to do it. If it's only that something that small, you know, if you've got friends, schools, and family, um, you've, got, uh, you've got credit cards. Now, I caution anybody in thinking long-term financing with credit cards. Bad, bad, bad idea. It'll just come to you. And after a few months of that, you'll just be going, I can't support the debt. You know, the interest rates are just crazy on these. So don't do that. But there are ways to play a juggling game with credit cards. You have to stay on top of it and you can get, hey, you know, pay off this credit card and we'll give you, you know, a year or six months or something with no interest. Right. So you can play that game for a while, but you can't play it forever. Right. But, but for a while, you know, enough to get your computer and your, your just your, your basic necessities started. As it gets bigger, I used a lot of real estate. You know, you can buy nothing down over the phone, buy real estate. That's a business in and of itself. I didn't choose real estate as the end game. I liked my businesses, but I used real estate to finance them. 
So you can take out a second on your home. Not as bad as a credit card. I mean, second on your home, the interest rate's gonna be, you know, one quarter of what it might be if it was a credit card. So that's another way. Uh, eventually, as you get bigger and you do a, a first round and a second round, you, you can go, once you've exhausted your friends, schools, and family, you can go to angel investors. By this point, you've probably got some sort of a business model. Something is working, even if you're not profitable yet. Now, if you're a consultant, of course, you're going to be profitable from day two. You just go out there and charge somebody your hourly rate and give them advice. Or better yet, just take their watch and tell them what time it is and keep the watch. <laughs> um, but, but if you're going to be doing are you crossing stuff, the streams? Are you crossing the streams on me? man <laughs> <laughs> if good. you're going to be doing something that requires some capital um may, maybe it's just if you're in the service industry most of your cost your expense is going to be on the labor side right so be very careful about hiring too many people you really want to make sure you need them before you hire them but then on the other side occasionally you find somebody but th this is as your business has grown a little bit so you're in a second stage or third stage but back to this first stage, how do you find that funding on that? You know, I, I will say the friends and family, you have to be very careful. Know what the downside is. You borrow a bunch of money from your family and your company goes south, that's gonna that's gonna stay with you for a long time. Mm. Be very careful about that. Try to go with a more professional route. But if you go to a bank and just apply for a small business loan, you, you have to have some sort of collateral or some sort of credibility uh look at sba too there is a number of ways i mean you go to sba right now if right. you say hey i was just fired yesterday this whole COVID 19 finally hit us harder right i was laid off now i'm gonna go do it i've had this idea i've written up at least the basics of a business plan and i'm gonna go get an sba loan the uh, purse strings are probably a little bit looser right now you might be able to get an sba loan pretty favorable terms and and put your uh, put your side hustle into action. I love it. Uh, we're talking with Troy Underwood, um, author, of how to uh, launch your side hustle. He's an entrepreneurial expert and guru for sure. Um, hugely, I'm just telling the book is just amazingly fantastic. Again, I'll hold uh, for those of you watching live on Facebook. I'm just holding this up for you just to see a little bit to see the cover. Uh, by the way, uh, get it at uh, order it. Uh, it's available at Amazon, any, every bookstore. It's it's available. You can get it right away. Um, it's also available at Kindle version. And I hope he does an audio version of this book, an audible book version, because it's really that good. Are you planning to do that, by the way? Well, it, it's interesting because I have been talking to the publisher about it. And it's interesting. And if your side hustle is to write a book, there are multiple ways to write a book. Today's world is so easy to write a book and get it published, self-published. Um, I, I really expected to go that route, but I did submit it to a publisher and they said yes. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, this is fantastic. So they write me a check instead of me writing a check. Right. So, um, no, I am communicating right now with uh, Prager, the publisher, ABC Cleo, who have had some just been a great relationship there. They've had wonderful ideas. And I look at them as the professional. Right. I've never sold a book in my life and they've sold millions. So I'm going to listen to them. But when I asked him about the, the uh, I wanted to do an audio version. Right. I'll just sit down and read the book and record it. It's right. kind of interesting. They, they weren't super excited. <laughs> because they don't sell as many copies of audio books as they do right. hardcover books. And technically, I don't own all the rights to it. We, right. we own the rights. They own the rights. Right. So we're working on that right now. And I still think it'd be kind of fun, even though it's not, uh, it may not be as profitable as just a hardcover um, book. That their, their, their avenue for sales is a lot of academia, right. a lot of libraries. So it's not as, uh, as well-rounded as another book that would have a, a broader niche that might lend itself, a, you know, a very popular novel that would lend itself to an audio version. But I, I'm going to push them. I want to do the audio version. Good, because I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I've done, you know, I've got four books and I, I've got uh, the first book I did uh, was an, is an audible and the last one I did was an audible. The other two were shorter. I just didn't feel like they needed to be in audible books. But um, I, I find that people love the audible book. So I really, I wouldn't, I would just say if, you, you know, one of the things you talk about in your book is that, you know, sometimes you need to talk to your customers to find out, you know, what's going on, right, in the, in the chain. 
of events, right? You talk about that actually a couple times. You know, well, here's a here's a customer, a uh, couple customers saying to you, saying to your publisher, hey, if we want an audible version of this thing, you know, you might want to pay attention to that because we we really do because it's, a, it's I'm telling you the book is fabulous. Um, we're, we're I'm moving on to chapter four, um, Troy, and I want to talk about sales just real quickly here because we we were running, it's almost been an hour and we're running, I can't believe it's gone so fast. But let's talk about the merit of small sales because often uh, we want to go after the big the big client and that could be a problem. So we should you talk about aiming for the smaller customer. Why do we do that and why do we not want to do the large client? And will you please do your ranch background and talk about the two chickens to the coop addition? Uh, the the ranch i'll tell you about the ranch but let me tell you about this the sales first um when you want to you want to perfect your pitch so i mean even before you let's say you had your pitch and you wanted to go to an angel investor or something practice in the mirror practice with your spouse practice on a fan practice with your dog practice whatever you have to do to practice it uh, i used to go to a sales networking group and i would give my pitch my intro hi i'm troy underwood this is what i do and, and the first 10 weeks, I was going, golly, why do we have to say the whole thing over? And then I realized, you know, saying it over, that rep repetition is great. And you need to deliver that, you know, whether it's your elevator pitch or, or your sales presentation, whether it's a slide PowerPoint type of presentation. So if you want to start that on the biggest prospect you can find, I mean, great, go for it. But I recommend starting it on a few smaller prospects. You know, maybe they aren't on the 27th floor. Maybe they just have a little tiny garage themselves. But if they're a, if they're a good prospect, you can actually perfect your product offering before you go out to the big guys. Mm. And, and, and that's okay. I, that's how I started. I didn't go after the, the biggest financial institution in, in the world. Now, eventually I did. I, I eventually got the biggest financial institutions in the world to use uh, my service and and even in the uh, that was for the electronic titles right. and even in the health insurance benefits administration after a while we didn't want to go to the small customers mm -hmm. we wanted large customers so be, be very specific because there's a very different um base there your your skills your offerings the customer their knowledge expertise is very different from a micro business to a small business, a small business, mid-market, mid-market to large jumbo enterprise. Enterprise businesses think nothing like a micro business. Their, their, their software selections are very different. Their servicing. So if you uh, if you can kind of find a way to get a friendly, to give that to, and hopefully close the deal, but know you and know your sales status. Don't try to be somebody you're not. It, it, Try to be a little bit more than you are. Keep pushing yourself a little bit. You know, the fake it till you make it. But it has to be real. You actually have to deliver uh, operationally from what you promise. The uh, the ranch, you know, I've said before, people would say, well, where did you learn to do this? And where did you learn to do that? And I said, well, I lived on a ranch. You, you figure it out. You, you don't have anyone to run to, to say, hey, I can't do this. So you had to be able to be a little bit of a renaissance man and do anything, whether it's repairing a tractor or, or bucking hay or whatever it is. So mentally, you have to be a little bit tough, and then you have to be very creative. So use those same skills in uh, in your in your business to figure it out. Do what you have to do. Uh, you know, it's very interesting growing up on a ranch, and then now the the big thing that I'm doing is all about a whole food, plant based. It's like you grow up with chickens and goats and cows. And horses, but we didn't eat the horses. We actually didn't eat the cows either. We didn't have to eat the chickens, and we only milked the goats, uh, but we ate the rabbits. So, you know, now you're looking at it going, everything I do is whole food, plant based. So I, I wouldn't live that lifestyle anymore. But that's that's how I grew up, and uh, learned learned a lot. Mm, that's awesome. I did too. Grew up as a farmhand. Matter of fact, uh, in the in Nebraska, I grew up in a town of 119 people. And uh, my last book. That I wrote was called Lessons from the Farm, Essential Rules for Success. And, uh, you know, we have a lot in common, which, by the way, I appreciated about this book, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, because I could hear some of that ranch boy, farm boy in you. Uh, the book's called uh, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, Start and Scale a Business with Minimal Capital 
Troy R. Underwood. And Troy, the thing I ask my friends uh, on the show, because you're no longer a guest, you're a friend of the show, and we're going to bring you back. I hope you will be willing to come back um, to talk Absolutely. more about this. Um, I ask that the show's called A New Direction because we ask people to, uh, we, we try to help people find a new direction in success, um, success or uh, leadership or life, career, and business. If Troy Underwood could um, leave us, leave the listener with a new direction, including your daughter who is now listening to the show live, uh, if, you could, if, if you could give the show uh, a new, she, <laughs> I can't even repeat what she said, but if you could, if you could give the listener a new direction based on how to launch your side hustle, what would that be? Well, it has to be the just do it, but you, you caveat that with be prepared, be prepared and then just do it. So you can't lose yourself in analysis, you know, paralysis by analysis. Once you think you've prepared and you have it down, think it through again and then do it. At some point, prepare and then jump. And sometimes you have to be able to take a string and some cloth and make a parachute on the way down. Mm. And you have to do that same thing with your employees too, because they may be hesitant to see your vision. Um, but if you really believe it and you've run it through and, and objectively, not emotionally, but objectively looked at this intellectually and said, yes, I have a great idea. Yes, it can make money. Yes, it has staying. It's not, you know, a fad. You know, we're not selling a lot of pet rocks anymore. Um, <laughs> then, then do it, make it happen. Awesome. His name is Troy Underwood. He's the author of the book, How to Launch Your Side Hustle, Start and Scale a Business with Minimal Capital, available bookstores everywhere. And we're so grateful to have him. Folks, that's the show. You know what I say every week, be inspired. Because when you're inspired, that means you can inspire other people. And when they're inspired, that in turn can inspire others. Folks, I'm going to be back next week with another great show, another great guest, another great book. And I am thankful to all of you and so grateful to every one of you who listen and download the show. Tell your friends, ask them to download and listen to the show, please. I really do ask that. I really do. I appreciate it so much. As I say every week, you know what that is, everybody, right? Ciao, everybody. To go a different way, yeah. The time has come for a new direction. your confidence and the answers don't make sense you got to keep your hope alive you got to know you can survive this is your time to find a new direction a brand new day a new direction things are gonna change Dreams will take you places you have never been before. Find your passion, find your strength.